Okay, good evening everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Today we're going to solve the big mystery of whether Drupal can be the backend API for a desktop application. Before we dive in, I'll just like to give a brief overview of my experience, my background, as well as my co-presenter, Vince, who wasn't able to make it today. So I'm a principal full stack developer at Pegasystems. I'm also CTO and co-founder of uh, my startup, NeverEnding Solutions. I have a deep experience in decoupled architecture. And in terms of education, I have a bachelor's in computer science from University of Rochester and a master's in technical entrepreneurship and management from the Southern Business School. I have over 10 years of experience in JavaScript, uh, PHP, Python, as well as experience in Drupal 7 through 10. My co-presenter, Vincent, is a developer at NeverEnding Solutions. His expertise is in UI UX. He got his bachelor's in computer engineering from Macquarie University from Uganda, in Uganda. And he also has over four years of experience in PHP, as well as experience in Drupal 7 through 10. So before we dive into the idea behind Drupal supporting a backend application, I'd like to go over the idea of what a decoupled site is so everyone's on the same page. So at a very high level, a decoupled site is when the content is separated from the front end in terms of the components, look and feel of the site, what goes together to build the site that you're seeing. The front end is, co is completely separated from the data that gets pulled into the site to form the components and form the look and feel. So when those two things are separated at a very high level, a decoupled site is formed. So how I got experience in decoupled sites. I didn't start working on decoupled sites until I started at the Media Current. And at Media Current, I was a lead on the Media Current website. So Media, media Current website said decoupled site. So I had to learn Gatsby and I had to learn how Gatsby pulled in information from Drupal, the Drupal backend, and how it efficiently generated, and how it efficiently generated the site after every build and, uh, and as, the, as the information, the API endpoints change, had to figure out the best of ways to generate the, the site the speedily, efficiently, with a performance in mind. It didn't have any experience at all with decoupled sites before then. But working on that made me pretty much fall in love with a decoupled architecture and it started opening my eyes to how powerful decoupled architecture can be and seeing Drupal as a content hub instead of just a website. So what really got me deeper and deeper into decoupled sites was as a lead at uh, re redeveloping the media current site, I was assigned the task of coming up with a plan to improve the site. So I had to come up with a way to improve the nature of how it was put together whether it to be changing from the front end of Gatsby to a new, a new stack site generator like Next.js, or whether it be changing how the endpoints were exposed from the Drupal end. So I did extensive re research through trial and error. I was able to learn all the components of what it took to build a very efficient decouple the site and present the idea to the media current team and CTO. The second thing that uh, really showed me the power of decoupled sites was the Penn State project, another project that I was one of the leads on at Media Current. It is a very large decoupled site, one of the largest in the world, if not the largest in the world. And working on this site, seeing how Drupal could power a site of this size and continuously feed information and, and how the front end could have successful builds over and over successfully really showed me how powerful Drupal could be and inspired, inspired me. And that's, that's how the idea started forming. So how they did it, a little bit more insight into the structure of how the decoupled site works. So on the Drupal end, JSON API is one method of exposing information via endpoints. There's other ways, but that's the most common way. So JSON API will expose all the information for nodes 
at specific endpoints and all the information associated with those nodes as well. So you'll get all the information you need to pull in on the front end. So the front end can either be in Gatsby, Next.js, or any other stack site generator that you want to use. What Next.js or Gatsby will do is it will query using GraphQL or whatever method that you want to use to query the information. It will query all the information from those endpoints and then pull those information, that information into the different components that are defined in the front end theme and the stack together to make up pages in the site. It will dynamically pull that information in. So the site represents an, an accurate depiction of all the information that's entered on the front end. And as the information on the front end changes, so if something is updated in a node, the information in the endpoint changes, Gatsby will see that, rebuild the site, the front end is updated. So at a very high level, that's how the magic behind, behind decoupled sites work. So the big question that we have here today is, can a similar concept work for desktop app applications? Can we utilize a concept like that to spin up a desktop application as a web developer? The answer so far is maybe. Don't want to give any spoilers yet, so the answer is, is maybe. So, so do we have any questions so far? Okay, if not, we can continue. So how do we, how do we accomplish this? So we'll need to have an app idea that can challenge Drupal in a way to see if it can be a successful backend application to not a simple desktop application, but a desktop application that offers at least a little bit of complexity. So the idea that started formulating has to do with desktop application privacy, which we'll go into in the next slide. But the stack, which we'll also dive into, is Drupal, Electron.js, using the Quasar framework, React, as well as AWS S3 storage. So the app idea. So the, the idea formulated with me identifying a need in a market. So privacy is very important, right? So that's why VPNs became so popular with internet privacy. So I noticed this need for desktop applications. So desktop applications have can access any files on your computer, right? They can ac access personal information, whatever whatever they want. A lot of people don't realize this. So narrowing, narrowing down that segment into the gaming seg segment, a lot of gamers realize this and they complain about it constantly and that there's not too many, not too many solutions for this. Narr narrowing down the segment even more, specific game Overwatch, which I, hear, I heard a lot of complaints about the game, saving people's personal information and just completely, store, completely storing it and being able to track anyone that downloads the game. A lot of people were upset with this and they wanted privacy. And this is an easy problem to solve. I could, there's, there's, this is a very easy problem to solve with JavaScript. You just need to be able to build a desktop application and be able to reset those values. And it's, it's, that, it's that simple, but as a Drupal developer, not able to easily build a desktop application. I felt like I was pretty much limited to Drupal. So that was the idea. These are just simple, some simple values you can, you can change the JavaScript or using the, or using Windows PowerShell commands or re registry edits, which you can access through JavaScript Node.js. So JavaScript front-end developer can change a lot of these values. And these are values that the games, desktop applications read consistently and save for about users. So that's the, app, that's the app idea in terms of features of the app, but the features that Drupal can support. So let's say you want to, the app to not be free. Let's say you want to, to have it be on a subscription basis, access key basis. Can Drupal support this? Let's say you want to have people be able to buy the application for a day, a week, a month, and use Drupal as the backend API for that. Who knows if Drupal can support it, but that's a, that's a requirement that we'd want for the idea. We'd also want the application to be able to handle registration. So users should be able to open the application, register the application, and then when they register the application, a Drupal user entity should be able to be created based on the information that they enter in the application. Hopefully Drupal can support this, who knows. But if they can register, we also want Drupal to be able to support a login. So after they register, they should be able to 
use the credentials that they registered with to be able to log in and validate the credentials. So if they match the user credentials, username and password that's within the Drupal database, they should be able to log in as that user and gain access to the application. So we'd want Drupal to be able to support this or, or uh, also be able to support this. So that's a lot that we're already asking of Drupal. Going back to Electron, so as, as a Drupal front-end developer that knows JavaScript, I wanted to find an easy way to build a desktop application without having to reinvent the wheel and learn something new. I know JavaScript, so figured out that you can use JavaScript to build Electron or app desktop applications with a framework called Electron. But I still didn't want to learn all the intricacies that Electron offered and I felt like it would take way too long. So did a little bit more research and found a framework called Quasar. So with this framework, you can actually generate an Electron application with just a few commands. You just have to install the NPM and dependencies with Yarn. And you can just, with one command, oh, excuse me, with just one command, you can generate a desktop application template just like that. So that saves, them, that saves me time. And then with the front end of the application, what's even better is that it offers an extensive library of components that you can utilize just to plug and play. So if you wanted to build, let's say, a login, a log login functionality with a field and buttons, you can just pull in the, you can pull in those components and using the framework and you don't have to build them from scratch or using Vue.js or React or whatever you want to use. You can just use those components using the library, pull them in and you already have all the components that can put together the front end of the application. And the next thing you'd have to do is just tweak the CSS a little bit and then you can make it look exactly how you want the application to look. So that was the option I went with just to, just to save time because I did not want to reinvent the wheel. So a little bit of a spoiler. So at this point, it's going to be a little bit of a spoiler. So Drupal is in the stack, so there, it may be a spoiler to hint that it maybe could accomplish this. So the reason why we ended up using Drupal is because that is where our expertise is at. And Drupal already, pro, pro, or Drupal already proved itself within PSU and previous projects that I worked on that it's a very big powerhouse that could handle what, whatever, whatever we put it, put it in front of it as a challenge. So also offers scalability. So if, if more and more users join the application, Drupal can handle it very well. If we want to populate the application with many access keys, Drupal will handle it very well. It's very good at handling structured data and it can scale very well and easily. So that's the main reason we chose Drupal. So AWS S3, this is a more simple reason for choosing this. So if we wanted the Electron application to offer automatic updates, you can easily integrate automatic updates using, the, using Electron. The main thing you have to do is point the Electron application to a public URL. And so we use the semantic versioning. So all the Electron application will do is look and check to see if the installer within the URL, so the public file path, if the installer has a version that's greater than the current version, it will prompt the client that there's an update and they can just click install update and then the updated code is automatically downloaded on the user's computer just, fr just from that. So we use S3 to push updates or if there's a new update to the app, we just put it into S3 and then all the users using the application will see there's an update, they download it and they get the, the latest version of the code. So the interesting, we're starting to get into the interesting part now. So how Drupal would power the access key portion of the application. So there's many ways to do this. The way we did it was we created a custom access key content type with one field. We used a key value pair field. So there's three types of keys, day keys, week keys, month keys. It's very simple, type, the type of key would go into the key field and the value of the key, which would be just the name of the application, just a random string goes into that, the value. If a key is redeemed, 
the node is unpublished. Very simple, easy way to handle if a key is live or not live. The next thing we'd have to change is adding a few fields to the user, the user entity. Because the users are the ones who redeem the keys, we'd want to be able to associate specific information with them. So the first thing and one of the most important things is adding a date field onto the user entity, and that's going to represent the key expiration date. So very self-explanatory, if a user redeems a key, if it's a day key, the expiration date would just, a day would be added to the, that field. The next field is a little bit more complicated. It's called an, a hardware ID field, and this solves an issue with a, account sharing. So I'm sure at least some people in this room have shared a Netflix account because they didn't want to buy one for, for themselves. This is good for the consumers, obviously, but it hurts the developers, people who sell the product. And there's an easy way to solve this for desktop applications. So you're able to get unique identifiers off of computers, like I was mentioning before. So we do this as well. We pull in, we use commands from Node.js to get the unique identifier off of the desktop computer right as the access key is being redeemed. And then it's saved into this field in Drupal. And now that we have that, if someone tries to log into that account using a random, a new computer, or if they try to share it, we can check if the, access, if the hardware ID value in this field is different than the one that's being checked and passed in from the front end, then they don't get access. It's simple as that, and that's the importance of that field. The last field that we added is another key value pair field to the user entity, which represents the keys in that a user redeems. So every single time they redeem my key, we save the type of key, so day key, the value of the key, as well as the date that the key was redeemed on. So there's two very useful contrib modules that we utilized for some of the REST UI functionality, the REST API functionality, so Drupal has a built-in REST API, but it's not as easy to configure. REST UI makes it a lot easy. It provides us with a UI to configure different REST endpoints. So we use this UI to configure the registration and login endpoints and any customization that would be needed there. We also use utilize the RESTful logger module, which, is, which was also a very helpful module because it pretty much it tells you every single communication that goes from the client to the server, which is huge because if there's a lot of users using the application, you're going to want to monitor and know what they're trying to send into the back end. And there's, it's going to be very hard to tell unless you have a way of doing it, developing it yourself, but the RESTful logger module gives you a view that shows every single request that gets sent to the back end with all the information about the request. So what's sent in the request, the information about the computer, like the IP address that is coming from the request. So any, anything you'll need to know to monitor what's going on between the client and server is logged within the RESTful logger module. And you get that functionality just by installing the module, which was very helpful and it was a, a huge time saver. So this slide is learning from, so learning from my mistakes. So being comfortable with decoupled sites, I relied on JSON API a lot. And I just, by default, I just was so used to making everything public and then just querying information from those public endpoints and doing whatever I wanted with it. So security didn't really come to my mind when I was working on this. So I, exposed some information like access keys, all the access keys that people would want to buy, they're exposed publicly at a specific endpoint. And a few pieces of user information was also exposed at an endpoint, so I treated it kind of like a decoupled site because my expertise was in decoupled sites. This obviously was, is very bad, very insecure. You don't want to expose all of this information to the public. So after talking with some of 
some developers, I was able to quickly fix this and realize how big of a mistake this was and how I saw this was creating custom endpoints to resolve that issue. So I was able to remove all the public endpoints and Drupal actually allows us to create custom endpoints through plugins. So if you look at the code on the right side, simple, simple plugin that you can use to create a custom endpoint. And the, in the URL path uh, string, you can see, you can define what the endpoint is. So the front end would just send the request to that endpoint. And then the information that the front end sends in would be in that access key string at the end. So with this, with this um, endpoint, I'll go into a little bit more detail about the power that you can do just from PHP in this one, one plugin. So access key, that's passed in from the front end and it looks like it's one string and it is one string but multiple things can be passed in that one string. So what the front end actually does is pass in three values in that one string and separates those three values with a specific separator. So there's going to be an order that the front end always sends these values in every single time. And the order is in Drupal user ID, dash, dash, the hardware ID, dash, dash, the access key. That, those three values, that's all we need to perform a lot of information, or uh, perform a lot of actions in terms of redeeming keys. So once that's passed in with the PHP code, we can just, just check the values, split the strings based on the dash, dash, and assign those values based on, assign those values to what they actually represent, user ID, HWID, and access key. So now that we have those three values, we can check to see if that Drupal user exists. If the Drupal user exists, we can check to see if the access key exists. So if it's published, so if it's published and available, then we can check to see if the hardware ID passed in is equal to the hardware ID that's stored in the user table. We have full access to everything within Drupal, right? We, this is in our custom plugin, so we can do whatever we want. So we can do that. If all checks, if all checks out, we can add the time that's associated with the access key to the user's profile and then just add that it was redeemed within the key value pair field on the user profile. So just like that, we can perform complex actions such as re redeeming keys just from a custom plugin. And if we wanted to add a little bit more security behind it or extra checks, we can do that as well. The only thing limiting us here is just our comfortability with PHP. So I'll leave the demo to the end in which I'll demo registration and login. And if anyone wants to see access key redemption, they can stop by and touch base with me after just so we can get through the security part. But does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, so I will continue to security. So for security, it, it's very important that we use SSL certs. These certificates are very essential. A lot of people wouldn't think that it's important because not many people are going to be logging into the back end of the application, especially in this case when there's not going to be content authors, there's not going to be really many people besides administrators going into the back end, but still essential to stick to the basics of security best practices because it will prevent security attacks that can happen in the future. Another thing that's even more important is API rate limiting. So what this means is that we want to limit the amount of requests to a certain number that comes in in a certain amount in a certain time frame. And we do this so the API does not or the back end does not get overloaded with more requests than it can handle because if it gets more requests than it can handle, that will lead to security vulnerabilities. IP address limiting and banning. This goes closely hand in hand with user input sanitation. So I'll go over user input sanitation very quickly. So with user input sanitation, we want to be able to sanitize and control what's, what's submitted from the front end. So in the desktop application, if tr someone tries to submit something malicious or something that's out of format, we want the front end to be able to handle that and format that in such a way to prevent anything dangerous from being submitted from the back end. But if there's an issue with the sanitation, if something gets past the user sanitation, or if we see someone trying to just submit inappropriate things over and over to the back end, 
we can see the IP address that uh, the requests are coming from and easily just ban them. This is uh, a functionality that's included in Drupal, so we can ban that IP address. Uh, and we can see the IP address, uh, like I mentioned before, from the REST, uh, RESTful logger module. So we can ban that uh, IP address uh, and prevent them, or make it even harder for, for them to submit and do the malicious things that you're trying to do. So that also goes hand in hand with limiting what the client can do. So with limiting what the client can do, REST endpoints, this is where this is where your understanding of PHP and the power behind what you can do in the in the plugin really works wonders. So let's say that uh, something somehow goes past the user sanitation and hits the endpoint. As a PH, as a Drupal developer, you get you have full access to what uh, is coming in to the endpoint. So you can perform as many checks as you want to, make sure the data coming in looks exactly how you want it to look before before performing anything that could be harmful to the database. And this creates a lot of limitation on what the client can do because we have the user input sanitation and then we have the extra validation checks we can do on the plugin end through PHP to make sure that we can prevent anything malicious from happening. So as a worst case, to, our worst case scenario, we can also have geo filtering when we're under a DDoS attack and what the, when you're under DDoS attacks, the attacks are pretty much from a singular area. So if you filter traffic from that singular area, there's a very high chance that the DDoS attack can end. So as a worst case scenario, you can utilize geo filtering as well. So now that we discussed security on the Drupal end, what's even what's just as important is the security on the Electron application end. And as a web developer, this is not something that we're used to, right? We, especially a JavaScript developer. If you're writing JavaScript code or front-end code, you're used to the code, it's you're used to it being okay with the code being public. Things are usually open source, supporting the community, sharing code, it's, it's kind of in our nature with Drupal and with as front-end developers. But I realized the hard way that this is completely different within desktop application development, especially if you work, let's say six months a year to build a desktop application, you spent hundreds of hours to put together this code that has value, that solves a problem for a specific a customer base. You want that code to be protected because someone can easily, if it's not protected, someone can easily steal your code, steal all that hard work and replicate it. And this is something that I had to understand, come to understand as a mainly front-end web or mainly full-stack web developer focusing on Drupal. It's completely different, uh, completely different playing field with desktop app development. So with Electron apps, you can actually right-click on an Electron app, open file location, and then the app is bundled into a .sr file. And that it stands for Atom Shell Archive Format. And this uh, offers a small level of protection and just because, of or just because of the fact that people are unaware. So if you see an SR file, you're not going to think that you can extract anything out of it because it's not like a zip file or a RAR file or something that's common that you extract things out of. But if you do a little bit of research, you can actually figure out, you can download something called 7-zip, right click the SR file and then exact, and extract the full source code using just a 7-zip. So just like that, someone can get the full access to the code that you worked six months, a year, however long you spent. They can get full access to it in 20 seconds just with 7-zip. And that's pretty scary. So there's a few solutions to this. One solution is SR Armor. So this is encryption for that SR file. This is available as an NPM package. It will encrypt the SR file within the build process of Electron. So if, uh, if someone trying to gain access to your code right clicks it and tries to, in, to extract with 7-zip, they'll actually get errors on top of errors. But uh, this is not a foolproof solution. Obviously, we have Google. Someone can Google how to bypass Asr armor protection, and then they can just follow the guides. So that's not enough. You have to layer multiple things to fully protect yourself. So the next thing is obf obfuscating the code. 
So this is very powerful. It turns the JavaScript code into something that's very unreadable. It's very hard to reverse engineer. It looks like a lot of zeros and Xs. I'll show what it looks like in the next slide. But this is still, it's still possible to reverse engineer this if someone re was really persistent. So my recommendation is adding a third layer of protection as well. So using a NPM plugin to transform the JavaScript code into bytecode. So once you transform it into bytecode, then it's very hard to reverse engineer and you will be very safe. You can feel very safe and confident with your code and that there's, it's highly unlikely that someone will be able to gain access to it. So to show what this looks like, so this is what it looks like if you use the obfuscator to secure your code. Very hard to tell what it's doing. It's hard to reverse engineer this. And then with the byte code, everything turns into bytes of code besides strings. So this, so your actual code, very, very well protected. So a combination of all three is what I recommend. So any questions? Okay, so I will go over the demo now and I'll show login and registration. And then if anyone wants to see access key redemption and anything else I can show after the presentation. So we'll just enter username email and just a password, click sign up and it will load for a bit. And then we'll check on the Drupal site to see if this user entity is created. So the next screen you'll see is access key, but we'll refresh Drupal site. And as you can see on my Drupal site, new Drupal user is registered right here. And we'll see if I can log in using this Drupal user just by logging out. And then I'm logged in and then prompted for the access key. And that, that is the end of the presentation.